Hello, everyone, and welcome back. In the previous lecture, we introduced the hyperbolic trigonometric functions. And what we saw is that these functions behave in a similar way to the regular trigonometric functions. And what I mean by this is that they have similar identities. Think of the double angle formula or the Pythagorean identity. And that they have similar derivative and integral properties. For example, cinch differentiates into coach. But of course, there are subtle differences as well. For example, cosh just differentiates into cinch, whereas cosine differentiates into negative sine. In this lecture, we're going to explore the respective inverse functions associated to all of these tri hyperbolic trigonometric functions. So let's go ahead, let's jump in, and let's start talking about cinch to start. Okay, so I said we would start with cinch. Now remember, we saw that cinch is an odd function. It's given by e to the x minus e to the minus x over two. And in this case, it, if you remember the, the very poor picture that I drew on the previous video, it sort of looks like a cubic function in a manner or a quintic or something like that. Uh, of course, this is exponential. It's, it has uh, serious differences. But if you don't label the axes, that's sort of what it looks like. But what's important here is that this is a one-to-one -one function. And it's on to. It covers its range is the entire uh, real numbers. So then the question is, what does the inverse of this thing look like? Well, the inverse, it doesn't have a special name. We just write it as cinch inverse of x. And let me offer up a little sketch of what this looks like. So if we remind ourselves that cinch kind of looks like this, y is equal to cinch of x, then cinch inverse looks like this. This is y is equal to cinch inverse of x. And these can be obtained by just mirroring these functions over the y equal to x line. So then we can ask ourselves, how about if we consider uh, the inverse of cosh? So cosh inverse as a function of x. So here things are slightly more subtle. And in fact, this thing doesn't have a traditional inverse for all values or that's that whose domain, sorry, whose domain is all values of x. Now, this comes from the fact that if you remember what cosh looks like, it sort of looks like x squared plus one maybe, or x to the four plus one, just roughly. And so of course, this thing is not one to one. For example, there are two values of x that return the value two in cosh of x. And so this is not an invertible function. But what we could do is we could restrict ourselves to x bigger than or equal to zero. And the effect has here that we get rid of this entire branch right here. And now we have a function that is one to one. And so we can invert it. And so in this case, again, flipping over the y equal to x line, you get something that looks like this, cosh inverse of x. And so maybe if we label some points here, this is 0, 1. And then because we're looking at an inverse function, this becomes 1, 0. Now, you get similar problems if you start looking at sech. So let's uh, just sketch it out for a second. So y is equal to sech inverse of x. In this case, you again have to look at uh, in this, uh, sorry, you have to look at such with positive x values in order to invert it. 
And I'll show you why, just one second. So we remember the such function sort of looked like a little bell curve. And it goes through the point zero two here. Oh, uh, sorry, zero one, zero one, pardon me. And of course, again here, this function is not one to one. So what we would do is we would do the same thing and we would restrict ourselves to positive X values. And then we can invert this. So let me move this, this label actually over to this side, zero one. And so the function will look like this. And this is the point one zero. And so now you can see that the domain of this function is actually all of the points from zero to one. So it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't have a very large domain. Now for the remainder of the functions such as uh, tan, uh, hyperbolic tangent inverse, hyperbolic cotangent inverse, and hyperbolic cosecant inverse, these things are all invertible because they are one-to-one -one functions. Remember, they're all odd functions. And so I'm going to leave it as an exercise for you to try and sketch out what they look like by using the graphs that I presented, or hopefully your own better graphs, uh, from the previous lecture for, the, for those original functions. And you again, you just use the fact that you're sort of mirroring these functions over the curve y equal to x if you want to see what their inverse looks like. Now, we have much like the original uh, hyperbolic functions or even just the original trigonometric functions, there are some inverses that help us deal with these things or some identities, I'm sorry. And those identities, well, they're going to relate uh, cinch and cosh together. And the way that that's going to happen, or the only way that can happen, is if we restrict the x values uh, to the domain that is common between both of those functions. So for example, if 0 is less than x, which is less than or equal to 1, then we've got the following identities. And the reason I need to restrict myself to x between zero and one comes from the fact that that's the only places where Cauch inverse is defined, right? That's this region right here. Well, the first one says that such inverse of x is equal to Cauch inverse of one over x. I don't have a, a completely intuitive way to think about this other than just saying, try to prove it using the original uh, definitions of Cauch and, sin, uh, and, and Sech. Uh, this one, I don't exactly have a nice um, intuitive ex explanation for, uh, but there is one piece of intuition here. And that is sort of, you think of, well, we know that Sech is one over Cauch so this has a weird sort of property uh, between the sort of one overs here, right? Cauch inverse of one over X gives you uh, the inverse function of one over Cauch. It's sort of a weird property, right? I think it's a really interesting identity. Um, so similarly, you can do something with the inverse of the hyperbolic cosecant, and this gives you the same identity in this case. And finally, because this holds for cinch and cosh together, uh, you can just use the fact uh, or the definition of hyperbolic cotangent and hyperbolic tangent to get this really nice uh, property right here. Uh, sorry, that should be an H in there. So you get these identities. They may not be uh, all that useful to you, uh, but they're still identities nonetheless. And they can, uh, for example, they can help you know, using, doing some computations, for example, uh, on, a, on a calculator, right? If you're to program a calculator up from the bottom and you're asking it to find, or if you're programming in a hyperbolic uh, cotangent function, this is essentially relating the values of hyperbolic cotangent to the values of hyperbolic tangent. 
And therefore, you would only really need to store the values of hyperbolic tangent. And then you can use this identity in order to figure out the corresponding uh, hyperbolic cotangent to go with that. Now, of course, you know, the main event, what we're all here for are the derivatives. So let's start in a similar way to what we did in the previous video. I'm going to start by actually finding a derivative of one of uh, these functions. So let's start by calculating d dx of Cauch inverse of x. So maybe I'll just put it as a, a question mark for a second. Now, the way that we're going to do this is we are going to um, actually find or we're going to use the inverse function theorem. So let's say let f of x equal to cosh of x. So then f inverse of x is equal to cosh inverse of x, right? So this is just the definition so far. I just wanted to give these things names so that I can write it down properly. And what we know is that from the inverse function theorem, that if I want to take the derivative of the inverse of a function, this is equal to one over the derivative of the original function evaluated at the inverse. Okay? And now what we can do, so this is called the inverse function theorem. And so what we can do now is we can fill in what we know because we know if the original function was hyperbolic cotangent, cosh, then the derivative is cinch. And you can evaluate that thing at cosh inverse, which is f inverse. OK, now what can we do? Well, I'm going to use the Pythagorean identity for hyperbolic functions. So let me put it in blue off to the right here. I know that cosh squared of x minus cinch squared of x is equal to 1. That's the, that's the Pythagorean identity, that cosh squared plus uh, sine squared is equal to 1. This is the analog of that. And so I can rearrange this to see that cinch squared or cinch of x is equal to the square root and we can take the positive square root due to the uh, due to the domain and ranges of these functions this is equal to cosh squared of x minus one so let's fill that in this gives me one over the square root of cosh squared of cosh inverse of x minus one. And now I can use the fact that cosh of cosh inverse is equal to one here. So I can say, let me put this off to the side. Cosh of cosh inverse of x is equal to x again. So in this case now, I get that this is equal to one over the square root of x squared minus one. And so therefore we have our derivative of Cauch inverse. This tells me that I get one over the square root of x squared minus one here. Okay, so there are many more properties of the derivatives that can be found through exactly the same method through these inverse function theorem applications. And allow me to just list them for you. And I highly recommend if you want some, uh, some extra exercises to work through, try deriving these things yourself. So for example, if I ask you to find the inverse of, or sorry, the derivative of the inverse of cinch, this is equal to one over the square root of one plus x squared. I will put it down just so we have it in the list. The inverse of cosh, we just did this one. 
This is one over the square root of x squared minus one. And of course, we've got this domain restriction here now that x is greater than one. Remember, the domain of Cauch inverse is x is greater than or equal to one. But of course, we can see that we have a singularity when x is equal to one. So we have a strict inequality here. Again, these are, these are minor details that are extremely important. So ddx of, let's do the, the inverse of the hyperbolic tangent. This is one over one minus x squared. In this case, this is for x less than one. So this is the same as saying minus one is less than x, which is less than one. I'm just using the absolute value to shorten the notation. Um, I can calculate the derivative of cotangent inverse of x. And in this case, I get one over one minus x squared again. But in this case now, I have x is, uh, the absolute value of x is larger than one. So x is either bigger than one or x is smaller than minus one. Okay, and so this just comes down to the fact that these things have different domains, these functions. And so these, these derivatives are not equal to each other because these derivatives have completely different domains, right? If one function is defined over here and one function is defined over here, they can never be the same because they can't be evaluated at the same points. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, Such inverse, this gives me one over x times the square root of one minus x squared. And if you want to try and, again, you're gonna have to use the inverse function theorem to get at these things. Uh, so we're not gonna prove them all by hand. Uh, I'm just going to give you this nice list that you can use and recall as you please. And so finally, the last one here, the derivative of the hyperbolic cosecant. This is, so this one is, is oh, sorry, this has a minus on it. Number five has a minus with it, I apologize. And here I've got another minus and I've got the absolute value of u times the square root of one plus u, uh, I jumped over u to x, sorry. Absolute value of x, the square root of one plus x squared. And that's as long as x does not equal to zero. Okay, so this is, uh, these are much more complicated, right? But inverse functions are always more complicated, almost by definition, right? Because we always start by defining the original function and then we try and figure out what its inverse is. And you know, a lot of the time it turns out to be a difficult problem. Okay. So just like in the last uh, lecture, I gave you the derivatives. Of course, we would like to know some nice integral properties as well. In these cases, you can just derive these things from the derivative properties that I just gave you. I will give them to you in a table again uh, with the hopes uh, that you can just sort of, you know, use them as you see fit, right? If you really wanna try and prove them, by all means, please go ahead, please try that. Uh, you would just use those derivative properties from the previous, uh, the previous list that I just gave you. So for example, the derivative, or sorry, the antiderivative of one over, let's say a squared plus x squared. So a could be any positive real number then this gives me cinch inverse of x over a. So we're gonna put the a in there because these will be the common types of integrals that you're going to see in this class. Similarly, if I want to find the derivative of the square root of x squared minus a squared, this is Cauch inverse of x over a plus c. Again, uh, u, uh, I keep using u, I'm sorry. Uh, x is larger than a, which is larger than zero. And so another one here, uh, this is coming from properties three and four above. They're gonna combine because we have the same antiderivative. And so we have to be careful. In this case, you're gonna get a piecewise definition. You get a squared minus x squared. And in this case, it's going to depend on where 
A and X are relative to each other. So for example, you might get one over A tanch inverse of X plus C if X squared is bigger than A squared. So uh, in that case, you are going to be in, in region number three right here. Uh, sorry, if you're less than less than a squared. And if you are in region number four, you get a cotangent inverse of x plus c. That's in the case that I originally had written down. That's x squared is bigger than a squared. So again, if you would like to uh, make this, this simpler for yourself, take a equal to one and x squared bigger than a squared is the same as the absolute value of x being larger than one which tells you that you are in case number four right here. Whereas if A is equal to one, uh, X squared less than one squared is the same as the absolute value of X being less than one, which means that you are in the hyperbolic tangent inverse case of number three. So, you know, no one said this is gonna be easy. It's kind of a pain. You can see even I'm making mistakes while I'm writing it down. Uh, it's, just, it's just hard to keep track of. It's very difficult. Uh, and especially from the fact that we spend a lot of time in mathematics learning trigonometric functions. And I would say that I'm pretty good with trigonometric functions. Hyperbolic trigonometric functions, we don't use as much. And so we're not necessarily as fluent. And so the hope here is that, you know, I, we can do lots of practice with them together. And, uh, you know, as students, we can get a little bit more fluid with these things. Okay, let me give you another one. Dx of x. Um, then the square root of a squared minus x squared. So again, I'm just going through the properties uh, from the derivatives and just uh, undoing them. But in this case, I get minus one over a uh, such inverse of x over a and then plus c. And this is assuming zero is less than x, which is less than a. Again, you need that piece in the square root of the uh, denominator to be positive, strictly positive as well. And the last one, dx over x, uh, the square root of a squared plus x squared. Uh, this is going to give you minus one over a cosecant hyperbolic inverse of, sorry, in this case, you want an absolute value here. Uh, and this is just coming from this, this property six above where you're defined for positive and negative values, assuming, uh, sorry, I forgot the plus C, I'm getting ahead of myself. Assuming X uh, is not equal to zero and A is positive. So much more complicated, of course, right? Uh, but, they look intimidating. Let me show you an example. We can see that these things uh, can be very, very helpful when we're solving integrals. And remember, don't lose sight of all of this, right? I keep piling on functions uh, and, and maybe we're sort of losing sight of where this all came from, but we're always just trying to solve integrals, right? We spent uh, a large portion of the introduction to this course trying to build ourselves up and show where these integrals come from and how they can be used to solve straight up geometry problems or physics problems. Uh, and now we wanna be able to solve integrals for more exotic functions, right? Because these, these uh, problems that we saw in the first bit of this class could come in the form of much more complicated or exotic functions. And so we wanna be able to solve those things too. Not everything is gonna be polynomial in life. Okay, so let me give you an example here. Let me evaluate the integral from zero to one of two dx over the square root of three plus four x uh, squared, sorry. Okay, so of course there's no substitution that can be done here because if you try and substitute, um, or I mean, if you can't substitute for three plus four x squared because in that case, you're gonna get eight x and there's not an x that's kicking around anymore. So still not gonna work. So let's start with the indefinite integral. 
And of course, this section is on inverse hyperbolic functions. Of course, this is going to be turned into an inverse hyperbolic function eventually. Um, once we solve the indefinite integral, we'll go back and put in the appropriate bounds. Uh, and then we can evaluate it uh, at zero and one. So we're not gonna do uh, de a definite integral substitution method just because the bounds become very cumbersome and, and, and difficult. But let's let say u is equal to two x, okay? And then this tells me that du is equal to two dx. Okay, that's good uh, because I can see the four x squared, that's gonna be u squared. And also the two dx is gonna be du. So the question is, what does the three, what should the formula for this be? Or you know, if I, if I look at my table of integrals here, which one of these am I going to try to use? Well, we can see uh, that we should be using the cinch integral. So somehow I'm going to get uh, a square root of a squared plus x squared. So I can change the variable. In my case, it's gonna be u squared. So that means that three is equal to a squared. And since I'm only considering a to be positive here, that means that a is equal to the square root of three. So after all of this substitution, I get du over the square root of the square root of three squared plus u squared, which from the first element in my table of uh, antiderivatives, gives me cinch inverse of u over the square root of three, that's u over a plus c. And now I can back substitute for u, which was two x again over the square root of three plus c. So we'll get better at this as we practice with it. Sometimes it becomes hard to recognize which uh, which piece you want to uh, substitute for, and if it's going to be a hyperbolic Cauch inverse, or it's going to be a uh, cinch inverse or tanch inverse, right? All of this stuff just comes with practice, like everything else in calculus does. So now the definite integral, in this case, we get the integral from zero to one of two dx over square root of three plus four x squared. Now we've already calculated what the antiderivative is here. So the only thing we need is to evaluate at the bounds. And remember in this case, we don't need to have a plus C because it's a definite integral. So cinch inverse of two x over the square root of three running from zero to one. And this becomes cinch inverse of two over the square root of three minus cinch inverse of zero over the square root of three. Now, cinch inverse of zero over root three, that's cinch inverse of zero. But because cinch of zero is equal to zero, that tells you cinch inverse of zero is equal to zero. So we can say goodbye to that term. And the final answer written in exact form is cinch inverse of two over root three. And if you're really desperate to know what this is, you can put it into a calculator. It's gonna give you 0 0.98665. But I'd much prefer if we just left it as the exact answer in terms of cinch inverse, uh, because you know that's exact. We don't really care about what the exact decimal places are, uh, at least not for this class. Okay, so in the previous lecture, we introduced hyperbolic trigonometric functions. In this, fun uh, in this lecture, we've introduced uh, the inverses of those hyperbolic uh, trigonometric functions. Uh, we saw that things are much more complicated, but this is to be expected, of course, right? Inverse functions are just by their very nature, much more complicated. So the only thing that we can say here is, is sort of be careful when you're working with these uh, because they can be difficult to get your head around. And it takes a lot of doing examples over and over and over again to get your mind around 
you know, how to recognize when these things are going to come up in integrals and which uh, element from the tables that I provided for the, the integrals or the derivatives, which one you're going to need to use.